morning. You coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for today. We really, really have. We've got comedian Joe Pasquale over here. <laughs> He'll be dropping the, the house and tucking into a strawberry Genoese as well as a plate of squid and prawns. And I'll be joining some more Singapore-style street food from corner chef Jude Kerryama will be here as well. <laughs> and my Spanish adventures uh, will be taking me to the Costa del Sol, where I'm finding out more about the region's famous ice cream and where it's made. Alicia Vasey is back. <laughs> Uh, she's here once again with more advice of free food. You can go out and forage for yourselves. And I'll be teaching you the essential guide to bits of kit that every chef and cook will need in their kitchen in this week's Little Masters. And that's not all, because we're joined today by a good friend of mine, a good friend of the show, has wowed us on the show before on Saturday mornings with his apple pies, remember that one? His deep-fried omelettes, that was <laughs> unforgettable as well. And the no-waste barges. It's the brilliant Ronnie Murray. <laughs> Great to have you back, Chef. Thanks for so having me. What are you going to cook for us? Something, some, what's, what's on the menu not, now, then? Not too bonkers today. Just right. uh, We're going to do a nice little fish pie, perfect for in the middle of the week, something we can all cook at home. Hopefully. Beautiful. So this comes from where you... Is this one of the famous fish pies right, from so a certain restaurant? Well, he, well, so it's very famous from Jay Shiki. This is a much scaled-down version, but it's yeah. taken me about 12 years to be able to cook, look or eat one ever again. So. <laughs> After you've... We, used to, do quite, we used to do quite a few. Yeah, we used to have it on the weekend menu. Um, and I was a pastry chef there, yeah. and we used to have to cook them for the kitchen. Yeah. And yeah, I'm still traumatised. So I'm, I'm, I'm just over it now. Well, Hopefully we'll be Because okay. we get to appreciate it anyway. We're going to be cooking later on in the show as well. But kicking things off today uh, with another classic, not a, chef, uh, not, a, not a pie, but a classic bread and butter pudding. Uh, and that's because we've got some amazing sort of different produce that we've got in front of us over here. And we've got to do more to support our dairy farmers, trust me. So I'm cutting out the supermarkets and using some produce from a farmer just down the road in Winchester. I'm going to introduce you to him in a minute. But first of all, for our little bread and butter pudding, I'm going to use white sliced bread. You can use croissants, but I think for this one, we're just going to do it really, really classic. Take the crusts off the bread, and then all I'm going to do is just melt some butter in here. And rather than butter the bread, I'm just going to pour the bread or pour the butter over the top just this to keep things really doesn't surprise easy. me, Chef. Well, <laughs> well you, you worked in a busy <laughs> restaurant. You were pastry chef. Did, if you spend ages buttering bread, It'd be half your morning gone, so no, you just... We always dipped it. <laughs> yeah, you just dip it, or, dip it or just <laughs> pour it over the top is the best way, really. But you're going to take the bread like that, you're going to take the crust off, and then I'm going to assemble this all up. We've got some sultanas over here to make your classic bread and butter pudding. But like I said, I'm going to introduce you now uh, to this amazing produce. So to find about more about where this comes from uh, and the amazing work that dairy farmers do all around the country as well, as well as just down the road. We're heading down the road in Winchester to speak to Oliver Neagle from uh, Hiltonbury, Jerseys. Uh, welcome to the show, Oliver. Morning. I can see you there as well. So, so t tell me, tell me, where did your love affair with this start? Is this, is this a family-run business? Yeah. So my um, grandfather started the Hiltonbury name in 1947. Yeah. My parents then took the herd and the name over in '76 uh, when they moved to Velmore Farm in Charnas Fort, and then um, my parents parted company in the late '80s. Uh, my mum carried on with the with the herd name, and then um, she gave up the cows in 2001, which is where I um, decided to buy two cows off of her, which I'd been showing. Yeah. And uh, kept the herd prefix, kept the name, took a farm on down in uh, Ashurst. Yeah. That farm then went for development. That was a Hampshire County Council farm, and then the county council have now moved up, uh, moved us up to Winchester new dairy unit and the herd is about 300 now i should yeah with the with the followers about 300 yeah and that he's 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 smart because because i'm i'm an i'm an, a, a farmer when i was a young kid as well i mean i know how hard this is so just give it a little bit of insight in terms of your day it starts it starts so early and so late i mean nature doesn't stop this is twice a day you're milking the cattle as well yeah yeah so we start about six in the morning um and then uh, we milk the cows. Me and my stepdaughter milk the cows. Um, we've got new new milking parlour in three or four years ago, so um, we can get a hundred through there in about an hour. Um, then there's all the calves to feed, cleaning up, feeding, um, and then uh, field work as well. We do all our own field work, so we grow all our own crops. And between all that, all the straw, the maize harvesting, silage making. Um, 
Then we milk them again in the afternoons. Um, we've got the shop on site as well now, which is well, gathering momentum. Well, all I want to I want to talk to you about the shop as well because this is where we are now. This is this is how you know, your your grandfather probably wouldn't even thought of this. This is this is where did this idea come from that you can then cut out the supermarkets and then go straight to the the public and have this sort of this. Well, basically, it was a vending machine. What is a vending machine? So tell us how that started. Whose idea was that? So we were struggling back in uh, 2012 when milk prices were crashing. Um, and I have <coughs> a, a, a nutritionist come to the farm every month to do the nutrition on the dairy cows and all the costings for the, for the business every month. Um, and we were really struggling then. And, and I said, you know, what, what's, what's the sort of best thing to do? And he said, well, why don't you put a vending machine in? And I said, well, what am I going to do with that? He said, well, just put the milk in it and <laughs> you should be able to sell it from the farm gate. I said, well, that's quite a good idea. And this is, can, can I just say, the prices were crashing. They're still not great now. The people are still producing at a loss as well. This is, this yeah, is milk. Yeah. When you're producing milk for how much and the supermarket are buying it for how much? Give us a little insight for that. Just to... Well, mine is mine actually is slightly higher than the norm um, because I milk jerseys, so therefore my fat and protein content's higher and that's based on, on what you get paid per litre. So I'm in the sort of 40s at the moment. Yeah. It's, cost, it, it's, it's, it's costing us about that to make it, to produce it. That's 40p um, a, a litre. I was going to say, yeah, what, 40p? 40p a litre. Yeah. Well, oh. when, I start, when I started milking back in 2003, I was getting about 28, I reckon. So if you bought a brand new tractor then, that was yeah. about 30,000 quid, yeah. 35,000 pounds. To go and buy that same tractor now is about 135,000. But that's just one example. Yeah, but it's 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 a story. It's just it's a story with a lot of this. It's it's the fact that you end your your end product, which is the milk, which nature doesn't stop. So this is twice a day, every single day, three hundred sixty five days a year doing it, yeah. and so you're milking it, yeah. and a lot of and, and a lot of people that are not producing Jersey cattle like this are actually producing it at a loss because the supermarkets already bought it for cheaper than they can produce it for. So basically, we had, we had, we had to make a decision of how we were going to overcome the shortfall in the milk price. And also with it going up and going down, it's like on a roller coaster. And when you've got fixed costs, finance, rent, electric, and all the rest of it, you've got to have set amounts coming in and out. Now, my milk buyer, they announced to me on the last day of every month what I'm going to be getting paid the, the next month, if it's going up or down. And that is, a, that, that, that is, that is just, yeah, I mean... That, we can go on to that forever as well. I mean, it's just, it, it's mind-blowing that you run a business and you run it at a loss. It's, it's, I, I think it's great. I can't think of anything. It's great. But this, this, is a, this is a success story that I want people to understand because you ended up with this, this sort of, this vending machine. So explain yeah. to us how it all works because it was new to you. How does this work? Because I live down the road from you. I'm coming. Because <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't hear about this. Go, go on. Yeah, well, I was one of the first in Hampshire to put vending machine in. And, like I say, it was my nutritionist's idea. So I thought, well, we've got not a lot to lose. Let's see what happens. So we put it in a porter cabin because I knew I was going to be moving. <laughs> so we sort of carted up this porter cabin, put this vending machine in, dropped a few leaflets around locally, and off it went. Um, and that, basically that, that, that has kept us in business. I, I, back then when we started, I was charging about one pound. Uh, I think it was one pound thirty through the vending machine, but it's also it's also. I mean, I was always taught for chefs. You, you support the local producers, support the local farmers. I, I'm, I'm passionate about it, as you know, and I, I try and promote it as much as possible on the show as well. The amazing producers we have in this country as well. But it's also great for the local area because you say you're the first person in Hampshire. When you're looking at a map of everybody else that's got these vending machines, so there's an awful lot of dairy farmers that have got these now. So. You know, there are, and and I think a lot of people have thought, well, um, that must be quite easy. We'll do that, and there's a few others doing it now. Um, but the thing is, we've been at it quite some time, so we 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 deal a lot with uh, the Food Standards Agency, Environmental Health, um, 
there's a lot in um, getting the right bottles, the right caps, the right yeah. labels, being committed to doing an awful lot as well as just looking after cows on a daily, daily basis. Yeah. You've also got to be prepared to have public coming on to farm. Yeah. And there's a lot of farmers out there that farm and they just want to farm and shut their farm gates and that's it. It's them and their farm. So yeah. you've got to be prepared to get right engaged with the public. But tell us, you've gone from vending machines to other things. So you've got a range of bits and pieces. The ice cream is spectacular. It's so ice cream, fudge, bits and pieces. Where can people get this from as well? So you can buy all this in our farm shop. Yeah. Um, it's open seven days a week, nine in the morning till six in the evening. Um, in the summer, as you come up the drive, um, I have all the cows out there in the fields. and We've got a little bit of a seating area there as well. So you can come up and have your ice cream and that and sit next to the cows, they're all there. Um, but we now do pasteurised milk as well, so we only batch pasteurise that. So we do 150 litres at a time and we take it to 63 degrees, hold it for half an hour and then cool it back to four. So we don't do what they call um, in-line pasteurising with a flash pasteuriser. We tried it, but because our milk has so much cream in it, it's it got so hot that it actually burnt the cream and it and it tasted like um, sort of burnt popcorn. <laughs> uh, and uh, and well, just before we go, how do you see the future of dairy farming in this country? How do you see it? You see that more people are having to diversify because you can only diversify, I suppose, in so much, can't you? In it, in business. Yeah, well, they're, they're having to diversify, but also, I mean, when I started in two thousand and three, there was nearly thirty thousand dairy farmers in the UK, and there's just over seven thousand now. Gives you some perspective, doesn't Jeez, it? Yeah. Quarter. That's, yeah, that's it's frightening. But what's 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 more frustrating than anything is we have some of the highest welfare standards in the world in the UK. Okay. And and what's most frustrating, I've tasted this. It's the end product that's the best, that the best stuff I've tasted as well. You so like ice cream? Yeah, yeah. I've just <laughs> had a bit of ice cream. I put it there. Hopefully, I've done it justice. We've got a we've got a simple bread and butter put in there with a nice little bit of scoop of ice cream with it as well. But before you go, I wish you all the very best to look with it. I really, really do. And I'm uh, I'm a massive supporter. I'm going to come down and find out where you are as well bring my little cart and then get some milk on my own. I think it's yeah, absolutely right. brilliant. And I, I wish you all the very best of luck with it, Good you luck. and the family, all right? That's it. Thanks Man. a lot. Keep doing what you're doing. And thank you from us and thank you from all the, the chefs and producers. Well, thank you from all the customers as well. But from, from us to you, thank you for doing what you're doing. That's all right. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Thank you very much. It's See a you pleasure. later. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. So there you have it. Uh, my simple little bread and butter pudding with, with Jersey milk ice cream. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, does it, really? Easy as that. There we have it. Bon appetit. Now, it's really interesting when you chat to somebody like Oliver that the, the reality of it is, can you imagine this turning up at work? You're at work, you've done a whole month, you're on a salary, that's your salary this month. Next month, to just decide, actually, we're going to pay you 30% less. Yeah. We might pay you 2% more the following month, but we might pay you 30% less. Can you imagine doing that on a day? It's absolutely... Well, you'd walk, wouldn't it? It's crazy, but, but that's what's... He hasn't got any choice, has he? But that's the walk. reality of dairy farming in this country. So, you know, luckily, we've got people like this on our doorstep like this, but you can look online as well. You can help the dairy farmers out. You'll be able to look online. Other people are doing it right throughout the UK as well. There's Scotland, Ireland, Wales. There's, there's places that have got these sort of uh, vending machines on their farms, and you can appreciate like, like, like that as well. And... Uh, the produce speak for itself, doesn't it, really? Shop local. It's absolutely... Exactly, shop local. Don't get any lo more local than that. Uh, this gentleman will be cooking for us a little bit later. Um, we'll be in the kitchen with Joe Pasquale very shortly, but don't go anywhere, because after the break, we're heading off to the Spanish coast for the latest leg of my food adventures. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'll be giving you a rundown on all the essential bits of kit every good chef and cook should have in this week's Little Masterclass. And comedian Joe Pasquale will be tucking in to a strawberry Genoese sponge very shortly. 
OK, it's time for more cooking and time to head off to Spain for another one of my food adventures. This week, we're following the footsteps of millions of British tourists as we head to the Costa del Sol for a taste of the region's famous ice cream. Enjoy this one. I'm on my way to meet renowned ice cream maker Jose Antonio, and I'm told that his Muscatel ice cream is a must-try if you're in these parts, even if it is only breakfast time. It's a bit like rum and raisin, but made with a local sweet wine. His colleague, Adi, is on hand to translate. Jose Antonio set up shop here over 20 years ago, and he's clearly doing something right, because he now has three that are all busy all year round. And apparently, there is a secret to his success. This is the secret? Yes, it's a sweet wine uh, from Malaga, yeah. Moscatel. Mm. Muscatel. It's like the secret, yes. So it's a little secret. There's not so secret anymore. <laughs> no, this is the special secret. Swing wine. Oh, sweet. sweet, very sweet. Wine. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. very sweet. So you yeah. use that with the raisins? Yes, it's yeah. macerated for 24 hours. OK. So uh, it, it gets, like, soft and absorbs the liquid, and that's how we made it. Jose Antonio spent two years in Italy learning how to make ice cream, so I'm keen to see how he makes his. The macerated raisins are blended with a bit of water and Jose Antonio's ice cream mix, a combination of milk, cream and sugar. The exact quantities are kept a closely guarded secret. See, the measurement of ice cream is quite crucial. A lot of people just think it's like cooking where you just go... Ch -ch 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 -ch. With everything blended, it's time to make ice cream. First with... is the mixture and then turns it into ice cream. Yeah. What you, what you have to have when you, you make an ice cream properly is you have to keep it rotating while it's while it's freezing, because otherwise you get big, solid ice crystals in it. So this bit of kit does it probably as good as anything. And how long in this machine? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, more or less, yeah. So all it's going to take, 10 minutes to set what is probably four litres of ice cream. As the ice cream starts to come out, Jose adds layers of the macerated raisins. Now, there's two things that affect ice cream like this, one of which is alcohol and the other one is sugar and they have a dramatic effect to the way the ice cream sets, as in the more sugar or alcohol you had, like honey as well, the more soft the ice cream is. Que se le pone un poco de agua, vale, a la a la mezcla, porque el helado es muy dulce. Entonces para contrarrestar para contrarrestar eso, se le añade un poco de agua para que no se derrita en la en la vitrina. That addition of water makes all the difference and it. I didn't see him how much he put in. I should have done but it's that water that makes the difference as well. And with the final scattering of raisins... Presentation's key as well. The ice cream is finished. You know it's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be good. The famous yeah. Malaga ice cream. Perfect. How wonderful is that? Thank you. Gracias. 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 How amazing is that? A disfrutar. Adios. It's quite interesting to see ice cream made like this. That muscatel is very, very different. It's lovely and sweet. When you think of this, you think of rum and raisin. It's not rum and raisin at all. It's beautiful and sweet. It's balanced. And it's breakfast. Now, breakfast is obviously followed by your friend and mine, lunch. And I've got an idea brewing that brings together muscatel with another ingredient that I've been seeing everywhere on my travels. Now, I thought of many ways to use this, to be honest, this muscatel. But I thought, rather than do a dessert, I thought I'd do a wonderful little dish with some veal. And I'd do it with onions, with mushrooms, a little bit of the muscatel grapes over there with potatoes as well. But you could just have a lock in and drink it. It's amazing stuff. But with this one, I'm just going to do a simple little dish using these lovely little veal chops. Just a decent amount of salt is all you need. So on one side and on the other. Now, the great thing about the veal chop is you can treat it like steak. But what you want to do with this is just take a little bit of olive oil, just a touch, drizzle that over the top. And what I mean by that, you can treat this like a steak. You can cook it medium rare, rare, however you want it, really. So a nice hot griddle on here and just take the steaks and they can go straight on. So they can cook away nicely. While there's cooking, 
We're then going to get ready for the rest of our ingredients because the meat needs to relax. That's the key to this. So when you make it, it's important. Now, however long it's been in the pan, that's how long it needs to relax and chill out before you actually serve it. So it gives us time to then talk about the rest of the ingredients over here. Very simple, really, with the muscatel. We've just got some onions. But we're just going to slice this all up nicely. Now, with the veal chop, it does have an element of fat on it as well, so to keep your eye on it, look at this. How good does that look? That's cooking away. That's looking lovely. Meanwhile, we've got the onions. Plenty of onions for this. But look, you've got the beautiful bit of veal chop. Now, I've seen so much veal in the markets all around Spain, really. I just wanted it to be at the right time to use it. We're just going to leave that to rest. It's important when you're doing this, kind of to treat it like a steak, I suppose. Just let it rest nicely. And I say slightly, it's going to want probably eight, ten minutes. It gives me enough time to then make this, really. And this is a, a simple little garnish, I suppose, sauce, all in one, really, if you like to call it that. I've got some beautiful onions over here, and I'm going to wilt these all down in this oil. Now, this is going to take a good five minutes to caramelise in the pan while that's happening. Have a look at this place from the air. So once you've got the onions cooking away nicely, in we can go with our garlic, like that. Bay leaf can go in, that can go in. And our potatoes, obviously this is going to be quite quick to cook, so we can thinly slice our potatoes. Now they can go into our dish as well. We've got some of this wonderful muscatel. Nice glug of that. Look at the colour from it as well. What you want to do is reduce this down. Now, you could use stock, and I'm going to use water for this instead. We're going to just slightly cover it. We'll take a touch of cream as well. Just a little bit of thick cream. That's going to go in. What we're going to do now is just gradually bring this all down, just gently cook it so the potatoes cook. And at the same time now, we can have some of these muscatel grapes. These are these wonderful sort of raisins that you make this amazing sweet wine with. And then mushrooms. And they're going to reduce down with it. Leave that gently simmering away. I couldn't resist these, really, from the supermarket. Like that. Beautiful. I'm just going to finish them off on the barbecue. Right, and see, that's done now as well. Just nice and simple. The onions, I just love these as they are, really. On the barbecue, these are just ace. You just want to put a little bit of salt on them and a touch of oil, a tiny bit of oil. Nothing else. Just let them barbecue nicely on here. But I'm going to serve the rest of it now, just nice and simple. You've got this wonderful potato, these onions, caramelised onions, everything else, like that. You can drizzle this with a little bit of olive oil. Your glorious veal chop. But a touch of the veal chop with it. And then you've got the onions. So, amazing, these. They taste phenomenal. You just put a few bits of these with it. So that's kind of it, really. It's that simple. The veal chop. If you treat it like a steak, look at that. You have it beautiful and medium in the middle. That dunked into the sauce. I love dishes like this. I love locations like this, surrounded by food. What a great way to kick off my adventure in the Costa del Sol. I remember how that tastes. Next up, we've got Chef Jude Kerriara cooking an amazing dish, and we've got top forager Alicia Vasey, who'll be dropping by the house a little bit later. But I'll see you back here in a few minutes. We'll be making a fantastic strawberry Genoese sponge for comedian Joe Pasquale. I'll see you in a bit.
Welcome back. Now, friend of the show, Ronnie Murray will be cooking for us a little bit later. And top forager Alicia Vasey will be dropping by the house very shortly. But first, I'm here with a comedian who hit the big time in New Faces back in the 1980s and has had ITV viewers and audiences at his live shows in Stitches ever since. It's the brilliant Joe Pasquale. <laughs> Ching Ching, good to good see morning. you, Paul. Good to see you. Do you know how excited I am? Well, me too, because we both share equal passions. Love of food, yeah. comedy, but yeah. flying. Flying. I'm, I, if I could go back 40 years to before I started doing this, I would have been a pilot. I would what not, what not... made you want to be? Because uh, what made you want to, be, want to learn to fly? Uh, it was because I always had, always had an interest in the RAF. My dad was, a, a, strangely enough, I don't know if you know this, my dad was a chef in the old cook in the RAF. Right. And he was always talking about playing. He never went up because, it, you know, he, he was downstairs, you know, making, doing the potatoes. Yeah. And so I just had a love... I just think the physics behind flying is incredible. It's fascinating, right? isn't it? It's, it's, well, the physics of the, of the universe is incredible. Yeah. It's not... And I was scared of flying until I learned how to do it. And then once you learn how to... I did the, I'm a Celebrity 20 years ago. Yeah. And that's what really was got that, me that into was, flying. That was 20 years ago? 20 years ago now, yeah, 2004. Was yeah. it? Can you believe that? Time just goes... So, yeah. I didn't believe it was that so long. Yeah, but look, 20 years. I know you love your food. I'm going to get on to see what I'm cooking over here, but okay. we're going to do a little genuine sponge, because you love... You want to know how to bake a cake. So yes. we've got in here... We've got some uh, eggs and some sugar. Yep. Standard, I'm just whipping it up like that, and I've got some flour, and I've got some melted butter over here. And I'm going to fold that into the mixture, which I'm going to do in a minute. But we're going to line our little tin yep. with a little cartouche and then pop this in the oven. So, first of all, I want to go back to the 1980s, yeah. really, for you. And, and for you, before comedy and all that, you, you, you worked around food. You were yeah. Smithfield Market. I was a Smith... I was what's called a humper at Smithfield's Market, yeah. which has a different connotation nowadays, but, yeah. <laughs> and I used to take the meat, meat around. We'd have to unload it from a great big, you know, refrigerated container. It'd yeah. be massive, giant. And I was only 17 at the time, weighed about, you know, I was only about nine, eight and a half stone, something like that. And these things were four times the size of me. And you would literally have to get underneath it. It was hanging on this big hook in the back of this refrigerator refrigerated lorry and you put your arm over the shin of the beef yeah. and the and the rest of the beef would be hanging down your back like a cloak of meat it'd be like lady gargoyle's meat <laughs> suit you know and you'd literally just walk down this this um end of this lorry and at the end there'd be like an 18 inch drop to get off which and this thing was four times heavier than me yeah. and it may sound like i was very strong it wasn't nine times out of ten i'd drop it and the law was if you dropped it you still had to carry it but <laughs> you'd get a great big lump of beef at the end of the week and a chicken plus your wages and my mum loved it but I, I used to have a Yamaha FS1E. Do you remember the fizzies? I do, fizzies, yeah. And I used to go up and down the A13 on this. At the end of the week on a Friday, I'd have my chicken in, you know, unplugged. We had the beak on it, the feet, everything. It was like the Roadrunner. Right. In a little plastic bag on one handlebar. And on the other side of the handlebar, I had this great big lump of, lump of beef. And, and I remember one day somebody clipped my, my wing mirror and it knocked the chicken off. And I was uh, totally overbalanced because the beef on the other side, the chicken had gone. <laughs> and everybody's bibbing me up down the road. And I thought, I'm overbalancing. It wasn't until I got home, the chicken had bounced out and it stuck on the mud guard. And it looked like I'd been chased down the A13 by this chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, my, uh, and I got home and my mum so disappointed. And she went, oh my God, no, look at this. What have you ruined the chicken? Because it was half cooked on the, on the exhaust. <laughs> and she just cut that half off. I mean, Still had it for Sunday lunch, and you just smelt of, uh, of twenty forty oil. It was just the worst <laughs> piece of chicken you've ever had in your where, life. Where, where does the bit from that to, to comedy bit? Where, where's that transition bit? The where, transition where, who from got that... you into that new faces? Was that? That your mum decided you're going no, on. How, how no, did that happen? What happened? I just thought, I could, and I did so many jobs. I was a, a, cl a cleric at the civil service. I was department of transport and environment. I worked at Fort at Dagenham. I worked. But you've done a bit of everything. Oh, I did a bit. I couldn't do anything. And then I got a job calling bingo and refereeing wrestling at holiday camp. I thought this is the life. This is show business. <laughs> And I've been doing it ever since, really. So you got a job calling bingo and... Re and, and Refereeing wrestling. Refereeing wrestling. Yeah. And they used to... The refer all the wrestlers used to come to the, all the holiday camps, but they would <laughs> always get me in a headlock or stick the, the, my head between their legs trying to break my neck with it. And it was, it was the worst. But I've got to, we've got to talk about new faces, because that, that particular time... I, I remember that growing up as a kid, watching that. that everybody used to stop. Yeah. 
sit in front of the TV and yeah. you sit there with your remote control that was still attached. Remember the yeah. remote? <laughs> We've got a younger generation in here. That yeah. Your remote control used to be attached with a lead. With a wire on it, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. But that's what that was... Yeah. Everybody used to sit there and that was almost the biggest, the biggest yeah. show. Yeah, and there was only... I think there was four channels in, that was it. There was, so there wasn't, like, 500 channels to choose. It was just four channels. And so you stuck with it. And I remember I went to the audition. I only went to the audition as a laugh. And in the afternoon, you, you did the show in the afternoon and the panel would watch it. And in those days... It was Ken Dodd was on the panel. And when I was having my makeup done, he came to see me, he sat down next to me, he went, Can I give you some advice, son? So I went, Yeah, he said, and he, he rewrote my whole act. He'd written every piece of work, he'd written, got a bit of paper out, he'd written everything down. He went, Get rid of that joke there, put that to the end, move that to there, do this there. When you take the rabbit out of the hat, shake it down your leg, you'll get an extra laugh there. If you do that tonight, son, you'll win. And I did exactly what he said, and I won, and that was it, and never looked back, really. That, yeah. that must have been incredible, that. Yeah, it was. But then for the next five years, I had no experience at all. People thought I was an established actor on the circuit. And I wasn't. And I died on my backside. Because then you did... Because obviously, you know, comedy... And you're, you're a master of the art now, but comedy takes years and years and yeah. years. Well, they've written 10,000 hours of it to learn anything, really, to, to get to that point, isn't it? Yeah. Of anything at all. But you learn more from, from dying on your backside than you do from going well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've, I've done... I've done, what, well, no, I've done what, four tours now, and it, you kind of learn... And it's also the different audiences, wherever you are in the UK. Oh, you've got to learn to adapt. Never the same twice. Never, ever the same. You think you, you might do the same... But, you know, with music, with the stuff you do with yeah. the band, it's never the same twice. It might be um, similar, but it's never exactly the same. Yeah. So, so tell everybody what you're doing, what you're doing now, because this, this, this tour... Yeah. I would think with comedians... You don't help yourself, do you? You start this 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 tour. It's it's monster. It's a monster. Yeah. Well, it started last year, and what happened was really, James was um, I've been touring on and off for, for for donkeys years now, but it got to the point where I was getting not fed up of the gigs. I was fed up of the travelling, and I thought, what am I going to do? How can I change this? And then it got taken away from me for obvious reasons, because of COVID. And then I was I was just a bloke at home in his pants for two years. <laughs> and I thought, oh, which was a lot of people, to be honest. Yeah, a lot of people the same was, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there's bits of telly going about, but the, for my, you know, live work, there was nothing at all. It was taken. Well, it was like like us in the the restaurant industry. The whole the whole world stopped for sure. But, yeah. But when the whole world shops stops and you can't actually do any of your job. No, and I, what, I thought, what defines me? If I haven't got that part of my personality to be used, I am just a bloke sitting there watching Netflix for the next two years, which is what happened. And even the government said, you know, um, anybody in the uh, industry of show business should retrain. What do I? What really am I going <laughs> to? You know. <laughs> What am I going to do? I could be a pilot. pilot, pilot. Be a pilot, yeah, but no. Not a commercial pilot. Like they say, imagine being on a, on a commercial plane going to Malaga and go, that's your captain speaking, don't <laughs> eat the nuts. You know, they'd, they'd never go with it. They'd, no one. No one would have me as that. People won't even fly with me. They won't be sitting on the same settee as me, but let alone getting a so plane. So, what was that like for you, seriously? Because that, you know. That two years was really hard. Um, yeah. I kept myself physically fit and mentally fit. I wrote, I started getting into, I uh, write horror novels as well. So Well, I wanted to get into that as well, because that's another side. Line to you. you, yeah. Where, where does that love of horror novels come from? Where, do, where does that come? It's from? just horror generally. I got run, so I got run over when I was thirteen. Missed a year of school. I spent a whole year basically sleeping on the settee because I was plastered from literally from my chest down to my feet. And so my mum and dad would go to bed, my brother and my sisters would go to bed and leave me downstairs. In those days, only three channels, and the telly would go off a little white dot at midnight, but up to between 10 and 12, there'd always be some dodgy horror film from Hammer on the telly, and I became immune to horror after that, and I loved it, right? But, but for but... somebody who'd never passed a single exam like I have, and, and, yeah. and to do writing and stuff like that, I mean, the enjoyment you guess must get now, having all these years... Of... Yeah. Yeah, I always thought I was a bit of a div. And then I discovered through flying that I wasn't quite as thick as I thought I was, really. Um, because, you know, you know, the exams you have to pass. If I could fly for a living, do you know what I'd be? I'd be a crop duster. They're really cool, aren't they? That'd yeah, when you really see that. Cool, it? It's not like commercial. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do that. I'd really want to so, fly. So the horror, the, the horror thing, are, are we going to see that? Or is that what is yeah, that? Yeah, well, I've got, this is, I'm on my, I've done three books of short, short horror stories, which are out at the moment, and then I'm writing my first novel this year. Well, I want to talk to you about the, the novel as well. What, what's that, what's that going to be based on? That's based on, um, uh, it's called The Fake Vampires of Whitby. 
Um, which, I know Whitby because that's down the road from where I was well, brought up as Whitby's well. Whitby is my favourite place in the country. I, I, you go there on a particular weekend and yeah, it's the goth it's weekend. It's the goth weekend. It's, well, this is what it's based on. It's based on a goth weekend. starts off there that um, they have a lot of fake vampires and it works out that somebody finds a... Uh, you know, because the cloth... Uh, the, the cloth, what am I talking about? The cliff is, is just uh, eroding all the time there uh, around, the, uh, around that coast. And the, the, the cemetery at the top of the steps, there's a hundred steps there, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, and at the top there's a big cemetery and basically um, Bram Stoker based the first part of, uh, of Dracula in Whitby where the ship they called the Demeter crashed uh, uh, on the beach there and Dracula came ashore and he used the, the cemetery up the top there as a, a big set piece for the book. So I've put it in the book that, that um, basically as a degradation of the cliff goes down. There's a cemetery up there and some of the, the coffins fall out and one of them is an actual vampire. And they bring this vampire back to life, all these fake vampires, and they become real vampires. And that's the base storyline that the whole of, of Whitby becomes infested. So, so vampires. just I'm going to make this cake properly because I know you want to take this home. Just to go back to the tour, so that the tour, the tickets are on sale now. Yeah. The t tour, you're going, I mean, the length and breadth of the whole of the UK. Oh, yeah, it's everywhere. But what I was saying earlier, so it got taken away from me. And then when it came back, the first gig back, it was like I'd never done it before. It was like the first time I'd ever been on stage, I was petrified. And, and then I thought, what happens if... Not that I couldn't remember what I used to do. What happens if I couldn't remember who I used to be on stage? What happens if that bloke that that isn't my personality that is used that hadn't been used for two years. What happens if it's down to me, the bloke that sat home in his pants for two years, has to do it? Not you know, because you're not that this bloke all the time, 24 hours a day. Yeah. You, this is James Martin, the chef, uh, and the broadcaster. But the bloke that you are now isn't necessarily the bloke. No, that's sat in my pants watching TV. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> and what happens if that bloke <laughs> in his pants has to do this today? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because we're all different parts of, of different personalities that make up the whole. And I thought, what happens if I if that bloke isn't there and I have to do it because I'm an introvert I know it's unseemly but I am socially insecure though in, in a group environment well like we've got a group of us here that are enjoying your company now because look we're going to finish off this nice little cake over here we've got just a small little cake yeah. over here we're then going to top it up with the sponge which that goes on here just this well less is more with this one you see that one and then we're going to take some ice and sugar yeah over the top good whack of this over the top and then what I've done with the strawberries, that's that little bit of caramel yeah. over the top. And then you dip each individual strawberry in caramel. Oh, look at that. And you sit the strawberries on the top. That is incredible, isn't all it? All over the top. And there we have my version of a classic Genoese sponge. A cake for you to have a little taste yeah. and take a little bit on. Thank you. My job's here is nearly done. Easy as that. <laughs> Right, I'll give you a little taster of this. Yes, please. So, a little taster, because you've yeah. got to take the rest home. Yeah. Um, but we'll give you a nice little slice. Look at this, look at this. Cut a wedge out. A wedge out. Wow, look at that. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh. There we have it. Oh, you get it, to taste is it, that. Is it moist as well? Well, you, you'll be able to find out whether it's a, whether it's a Bake Off winner, but look, look, oh. it's like... Oh. But, yeah, it's, That's happy with that. it's good, oh. isn't it? Oh no, it's not good. It's amazing. You're happy with that? Good. Oh, I'm very happy. It's a good start of the day. One awesome. happy customer. Right, oh. I'll be serving up a dish of salt and pepper prawns and squid for Joe later on in the show. And we've got more cooking on the way. This time from another fellow pastry chef, Ronnie Murray. That's coming up very shortly. Join us again after the break when June Kariyama will be treating us to some Singapore-style street food. See you after the break. Box it up for you. Is that right? Not Are you a problem. Sure you don't mind. No problem. Welcome back. Now, still to come, I'll be showing you all the essential bits of kit every chef and cook needs in this week's Little Masterclass. And Alicia Vasey will be here with more food you can go out and forage for this weekend. But first, I'm here with Ronnie Murray, and we're about to enjoy a dish uh, from a New Zealander who won rave reviews from his Auckland and London places before setting up shop down in Cornwall. It's the brilliant Jude Kariyama. Thank you very Great much. Great to have you back on the show. So, what are you going to... This is, this is an unusual dish, but it's, it's something classic. No, it is. It's classic of Malaysia. Thank you for having me back, yeah. by the way. 
This dish is called a roti john, yeah. and it's a street food dish. So the story behind this dish is that uh, they reckon in Malaysia in the 1960s, an Englishman came past a street hawker, yeah. and he said, look, can you make me a sandwich? I think he's probably resembling something like a bacon and egg sandwich, right. and he got this. <laughs> which <Was> is, <laughs> he got, sorry, I'm not going to call you John today, Ronnie. Right. But yes, uh, so Mr John. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start by making the, the mince. So it's a street foody sort of dish, then, is it? It, it, it is. So it's basically a meaty omelette. It's right in your um, street, this, isn't it? Sounds perfect yeah. for me, yeah. I think the, the key thing Can't for wait. this is that um, the ingredients are pretty much always there. You always have some curry powder, so that's, you know, that's nice and easy. Um, and just, you always got soy sauce. Wild garlic's obviously not always a, a thing that you have very often, but yeah. everything else should be in your... Uh, in your cupboard, yeah, small cupboard. Okay. So it's like a, like a, well, just a meaty based omelette, really. Absolutely, so, okay. absolutely. So I'm going to get a little bit of oil into the uh, pan. So I'll fire that up for you and get it Thank nice and hot. You. Both of those are nice and hot, really. So Brilliant. onions and garlic. So that's all we need. We've got some ginger right here. Sorry, take yeah. that out of the way. And we've got some curry powder. I can see what you mean. This gets really hot it's, really it's, quickly. It's, it's, it? Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit serious. Let's pop this in there. In with the onion, you want to saute that until it's nice and golden, really. So that's yeah. going to take a little bit. We can probably yeah, no. turn it up a little bit more, I reckon. We'll get that beef mince so in there. So you've got, you've got garlic. So I've got some Malaysian curry powder, which is going to go in. Um, Used this before? No. Nope. So there is a different mix. So there are different types of Malaysian powders. It's not as strong as Indian curry powder. It's not. So I actually like fragrant, mine with a bit more garam masala. More fragrant, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of different... Uh, you find that Malaysia's like a, the fusion Asian country where it's got, a, um, it's got a huge Indian population, so they've got Indian spices, they've got the indigenous spices, they've got Thailand, Thailand right beside you, you've got Singapore. So all that all together has made this incredible different style of food. It's yeah. all kind of mashed together. Yeah. So we've got the mince here. So all that food and someone still asks for a sandwich? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So no more spice, for goodness sakes. Can I just have an egg sandwich? So there's your spices got in, yeah? That's it. So this is going to be really simple. You don't want to overcomplicate it. It's just really simple. It's just a little bit of curry powder, mix that through. Well, we'll turn that down a little bit so we don't burn the spices. Uh, bit of seasoning. Bit What's of salt. the liquid you're putting in? So there's a little bit of beef salt. So just in case, it gets, well, you want to get it nicely caramelised, but you don't want to burn those spices. Okay. But you've got to toast the spices off, right? Absolutely, that's the key. In this country, we're not great at doing that. So, no. So this is one of the classic right. street foods if you go visit there, is it? Absolutely. Um, so there are different versions. There's a seafood roti, but I, I can't remember what the name of that one is. I, I obviously only go for a roti jong. That's why I'm right. making it here today. <laughs> I'm just going to add a couple of tablespoons of soy sauce, because soy sauce makes everything taste good. Great seasoning And you well. use the dark one or the light one? I use the light one for seasoning, dark one for colour. Right, okay. Um, the objective of this is not really the colour, it's the flavour, because this is going to go into um, the, uh, well, into the omelette. Yeah. Let's have a little taste this. Is this. this. If there was a dish that was right up your street, right, this would be yours, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. This is... This 100%. Yeah. Mm. So you allow that to cool now. I'm going to let that cool. Yeah. And I'll pop that on the side. And, and we've got one, into... we've got this that... Ah, oh, yeah. This is the finished item, so... Something we made earlier. Yeah, exactly. So that's that one. And so now I'm going to need these pans on a nice medium heat. Should I attempt to do that? Oh, got that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I won't touch it. Just leaves it with me, that yeah, way. Yeah. I, I can't say I blame him, that's why I do it. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is just make a, a quick omelette mix. So Try. two eggs per person. Yeah. Try not to make too much of a mess with the eggs. So this, the, 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 uh, the spring onions and the... the... Cucumber, am I doing this right? I'm... Oh, that's perfect, Covered. absolutely perfect. It's uh, going to go in the garnish, but... Okay. I'm going to steal half of those. Could you do you mind cutting that again for the omelette mix? That'd be do that perfect. again. That's right. Thank you. So this is such a simple dish. Here we go. We're just whisking. There we go. That's our omelette mix. That's nice and simple. Pop that over there. Chuck in some of these spring onions. I'm probably use a little bit less than that. Thank you, chef. Yeah, so ready. generous. That's all right. Uh, it's, it's got all the hallmarks to a better omelette than you used to get to. <laughs> Chop this up? Yes, please, that's perfect. Because okay. then you want to add the mince to this, I suppose. I do, indeed. So it's just wild garlic season, so why not? I mean, this is not traditional. You can change this however you want. Um, I'm just going to turn those pans down to a... There you go. So, yeah, thank you. That is great. So I'm going to mix that through. Do you want all this lot together or do you want it separate? Um, just the spring onions in that bowl would be lovely. Um, and maybe if you could pick some lettuce leaves, because they're just going to go into the 
Sandwich. Oh, Look at that. Into the sandwich as well. Yep, that's good. You need a lettuce and your sandwich. Here we go. Pop those out of the way. <laughs> so with this, we've got some mitts. Right. We're going to add as much as you like. So I think for us, we're going to add quite a bit into there. I mean, if, it depends how you how you like it, really. So I mean, is this classic? This is like an open omelette, then, is it? Is that what you do? So what, sorry? Open omelette. You yes. Just, yeah. So you'll you'll see how, how it works. So I'm going to put this into the pan with some butter. Because I know somebody who likes butter around here. I don't know what you're talking about. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Be known. Yeah. The, no odd, idea. the odd bit. There we go. Bit of butter. Make sure this doesn't smoke too much. It is going to smoke. This could be on even lower, I reckon. So, and here, let's get a bit of the egg mix. So you want to get enough omelette mix so that you're going to cover the size of these little bread rolls that we've got here. There we go. In it goes. I was thinking it's going to be thick in this, but it's not. It's actually, it's the, it's actually thin, isn't it? Like a, it like, is. like the set, like a sandwich. Yeah. You'll see. There you go. That goes in like that. Nice and simple. Then I'm going to cut these in half. And this goes onto the So can you mix. do this with any, any bread? Yes. I just found that these are really quite good. They're yeah. kind of like a half panini. That goes on at this. Ah, this is right up his street if I'm not him. Look at that, there we go. Egg in. I'm thinking I've got a gazebo. <laughs> <laughs> With what's about to happen? Because you've got you've got on here, you've got the, the crispy fried onions. Yes. What so, else have we got? So I've got some jalapenos. You can use whatever chilies you want. You can put right. some Thai red chilies in there. I think it's kind of nice when you make these for everybody, they can really garnish it themselves. So they can put as much chili as they like. Right. So with this little egg on it. I just got to pop this under here, perfect, so just make a little... Perfect street food, couple of pans, yeah. garnish in front, let people crack on. Yeah. Oh, there he is, that's fine. Look at that. So <laughs> they'll stay like that. And just this let is... that... Do you know what, when I saw good. the recipe, I thought, what, how on earth, what is this, what is... <laughs> now I'm getting it. Now, I suppose, you, yeah. you, you build it all up. Yes, absolutely. So I'm thinking, Jude, in the summer, when your restaurant's really, really full, I'd yes. have a gazebo outside <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the car yeah. park. Just for you. So that's what... <laughs> this is a sriracha, so, but you can put what, your favourite chilli sauce on there. No, no, you're there. <laughs> <laughs> a mayonnaise. Not All a right. shop-bought one, of course. OK. <laughs> but you mayonnaise. can do, you can do a shop bought one. That's absolutely fine. So what's in that mayonnaise? Are there something in that? Is it? Just is... really, no. There's just a really simple homemade mayonnaise. Okay. okay. I know somebody doesn't like or can't eat it. Well, I'm well, allergic, I allergic to. Yeah. The weird thing is, people I think I'm taking. I'm allergic to shop bought mayonnaise. Like what? Severely ill. Oh right. So you've got. Can we turn that down you've got a the, bit more? Turn that off. Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. There you so go. So that's crispy fried onions. Crispy fried onions. You see, it's just all well, my, one of my favourite ingredients. And there's a reason why you're doing this on one side? Yes, because uh, I'm going to put the salad on the other side. We're just going to close it up together, just like you would a sandwich. You know what I would have done? I would have actually put the cucumbers down first, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> right. There you go. Do you want me to do the other one for you? Thank you. I'll do the other one. Thank you very much. Some of that. Some lettuce. It's just nicely there. just cooking away, just gently and toasting it, hopefully. So you get it fried. It's fried as well on the other side. Yeah. And just a bit of cheese. And that. There we go. And then to finish it off, got some coriander leaves. Yeah. I'm sure loving this, there. really. It's great, isn't it? Oh, it's... <clears throat> so you still find this? If you're going around the hawker stalls and stuff, you still find stuff like this? Yeah. Things? Right. Absolutely. Uh, hawker stalls are the best way to eat in any Asian town, uh, especially in Malaysia and, yeah. and Singapore. Well, God, the Malaysian don't... markets are just oh. phenomenal. Right? Unbelievable. Have you been to yeah. KL, Kuala Lumpur? Yeah, a long time ago, but yeah. Yeah, the street food scene All was the just... I mean, that was... I was there 20 years ago before we had any street food here. It blew my mind. Yeah. So I would normally wrap this <clears throat> in this so you oh, could yeah. actually grab it. So. Here we go. I'm going to close it up. Let's see I've how got it a long, I've got a long journey home. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is a takeaway. Take yeah, yeah. So, that's quite hot, that side. <laughs> so, there we go. That's your sandwich. And you would serve it like so. Wrap it up. Yeah. Wrap it like so. Like a normal sandwich. And then you just cut them in half. Beautiful. Like so. Look at that. It's one little sandwich. 
but this one. I think maybe uh, we put it like yeah, that. Yeah, fit that one there. And, and then this we'll one we're going to leave, leave this, open. Leave this one open, yeah. Right, see ya. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that off you because we need a shot of that one. Yeah. But I'll let you cut that one on the, put it on the board and then cut, I'll, get rid of your, I'll get rid of your pan. Thank you very much. There I'm we loving go. this idea, I think. But it's, it's a fun it's thing. Like a you can proper be... toasted sandwich, isn't it, that? It's something you can have any time of the day. That has just elevated the sandwich game, isn't it? <laughs> You know what I'm having to do for lunch next week at home, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dad. Yeah, I can imagine that's so. Well, I love the idea that you can mix and match it. You can use that you can you don't have to use beef mince and everything else, but yeah. it's just Well you could do seaweed. Mm. Oh, I just made a mess of this one, but hey, I'll put it back together just for the shot. Thank you, Chef. Loving that. It's quite, you know. An elevated toasted sandwich, basically. It's proper elevated. It's a proper. That's ele elevated the toasted it's sandwich. It's a proper thing. elevated toasted sandwich. Then, so give us the name of this dish. Then it is a roti John. How good is that? Looks amazing. Well done. Stop work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Choose your weapon, Chief. Oh, choose your weapon. I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna join you in this one. Yeah. This is, this is, this is pretty, pretty special. Yeah, I, do you know when you, th when you're thinking about it, and you read about the recipe, I knew you were coming on, I'm thinking, what on earth is that gonna look like? I d didn't envisage it was gonna be look like that. Oh my goodness me. Yeah, that's brilliant. Oh, good. That is absolutely spot on. Thank that you. Is yeah. a stunning sandwich. That. The sriracha and the onions, and it's perfect. People think there's a lot of stuff going on in there, but the flavours are nice and clean, oh. aren't they? You can taste all of it. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's I love that. And Malaysian food is very much like that. It's just big and punchy, as you know. You've been, you know, it's it's delicious. Cornwall's very lucky. There you have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> dude, everybody. Thank you. Uh, right, Ronnie will be trying to talk to him. Juice dish a little bit later with a fish pie, and I'll be showing you all the essential bits of kit every chef and cook needs in this week's Double Masters. That's coming up a little bit later, but join us again after the break. We're getting more expert foraging advice from the one and only Alicia Vasey. That is brilliant. Thank See you. See you after the break. Welcome back. Now, a chance some more to comedian Joe Pasquale. Later on, I'll be telling you what kit chefs need and what it all does in this week's Little Masterclass. That's coming up next. But first, I'm here with Ronnie, and we're about to get another lesson in seasonal produce that won't cost you a penny from top forager, Alicia Vasey. Yay! Now, before we even start, before we start, I have a list, I have a card of things that we're going to discuss on the show. Oh, and you've never shut up about it. So that's, let, me just, let me just say, what we're discussing today, we're going to discuss mm -hmm. crow's garlic, monk's beard and sea kale yeah. with Alicia Vasey. Foraging item, one plus one. Yeah, we can still talk about it. I ain't got it. But, <laughs> any reason why? Or... <laughs> it's just, it's like, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like a supermarket, right? Yeah, you get substitutions when it's not all there, is it? Is it? Yeah, well, it's just like, it's like nature's garden. Right? So, sea kale, can you get it? Well, technically. Right. <laughs> I might as well get rid of this card, but go on. Yeah, stick it, yeah, yeah, yeah go on. What, yeah, are, we, what are we doing? It, yeah. yeah, we've got the good stuff, right? What are we I'm doing? I'm the good stuff. I'm still being the good stuff. Well, I've clocked these straight away, so... Yeah, I talking? can't even... Right, so we have got blonde morels. Yes. All right? So we have black morels, which you use a lot of in restaurants. Yeah. OK, you get them ported in a lot from abroad. And we have these native ones, which are also native, but we've right. got these blonde ones. So what, what is... Is it the... Colour, taste, yeah, what, what no. is... They, they taste literally the same as the other ones, to be fair. But <laughs> <laughs> they're just... They say, well, you met Alicia before. <laughs> it's what I can get at the time. Right. All right? That's what it boils down to. It's what okay. I can get at the time. So where right? would these be from in the UK? Where, where are these from? Right, you can get these absolutely everywhere. And mine always come out every year on the dot, June the 6th. So I know that I don't even have to bother looking. I'll go June the 6th, right, yeah. Ding, they're all there. No matter what the weather is. No matter what the weather is, it doesn't matter what it's like. June the 6th, always there. It's bizarre. So do they grow in the same place, the same spot every single time? All right, OK. So if you have mushrooms and you pick them there, there and there, right, you pick them, make sure you cut them, like these ones. So you have to cut them, not Yeah, you have to cut them. You go back next year, because you haven't ruined the mycelium on the bottom, they'll be there, there and there, OK? So they'll spring up different... But 
in the same patch. Now, you talked about my... This is like an underground network Yeah, the, below yeah, the, the, the underground filaments that are attached to these that have a little network, and you will find them... i tell you what, best places are in woodland where they've got, like, um, like a lot of mulch. And sometimes you will get them in wood chippings from garden centre. Right, you get that a lot. I'll get pictures sent. I've got some. I've got some wood bark from garden centre, and I've got all these funny little mushrooms that look like brains that have come up. And I'm like, See, no, that, that's never happened to me. The amount of yeah, wood bark I've yeah, paid no, for, I'd be happy. It's <laughs> not cheap. Yeah, it, it, it can't happen to and me. And why either. the hay? What 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 is the significance right, so, with hay? Right. So the thing is with mushrooms. Um, They've all got like different moisture contents. So what you need to do is store them differently. So like when you get those in the supermarket, they're all right with plastic on. And these ones, these also will deteriorate. So what you need to do is keep them with the hay and the hay just dries them out a bit. Yeah, that's good. So the other thing you ought to look out for is when you're picking morel mushrooms, um, there's two things. You've got false morel mushrooms and they look like curly little brains. These ones have like little striations. Can you see how they're going like little rows almost? Yeah. Right, it has to go in rows. If you don't have any uniformity on it, just leave it alone, all right? And what does a false... Leave it alone, I mean, it's not... Yeah, yeah. Just, just don't bother with it. It has to have... It's not going to tell you what happens yeah, to you. Yeah, I was going to say, then, what just, happens just, to you if you eat a false morel? I've never ate one. I've never met anybody who's ate one. There's probably a reason for that. still alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't, right? okay. That's why I don't pick my right. shoes. But, <laughs> obviously, and what you've got to do is because I've, I've, I've mentioned it before, it's got a compound called hydrazine in it, which can be very toxic. The toxic levels depend. So you do need to cook it classical French way, so like a bit of stock, Madeira wine, and it will dissipate through the air. See, I've told so many chefs from, from you coming on the show, I let, it was one of the things that I just, I remember so many different things that you said, but, <laughs> but this you just think, when you, because chefs, you go sauce them in butter and just Oh, yeah, flavour. It's really bad, isn't it? It's it really is. bad. It is yeah. really bad. And how many good chefs have you known who's like, yeah, and then you went and did a little bit of research yourself, didn't and you? And then you realise the French, the, the reason why they cook it in liquid and, and that kind of stuff, a little bit of water, and it's, yeah. They, yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah, and you just don't know your toxic... Every mushroom, you've got to remember this, they're all a chemical compound, and that's where your toxicity levels So in. I've sautéed some off in a little pan with a little bit of butter. I've added some Madeira. I've added some of this little veal stock, and I'm bringing it down. I'm going to serve that yeah, with a nice yeah, little bit of steak. Yeah, and you can try them first. A nice little <laughs> bit of steak. <laughs> Thank you. Nice little bit of steak as well. So, so we're moving on for that one that wasn't on my list. <laughs> the other one that wasn't on my list is the green one. What, what, is, what is that? Spring Beauty. That's not you. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is that? <laughs> We're good mates, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah. so what is what is this? It is it's spring beauty. Yeah, but what what is it? Because well, I thought of you and I thought spring beauty. So <laughs> right, that's why we haven't got any of that other stuff. I just honestly, I just what is it? I just oh, it's James. I'll bring spring beauty on. Right, right. yeah. What, what, well, it's green. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm looking at my garden. There's a lot of things that's greens out there, but I don't. What what am I looking for? Well, I tell for? you what. Okay, so where is it grown first of all? America. And then it was invasive. So it's one of those... Yeah. Right, it's one of those thought, plants... Thought... <laughs> Shush. Yeah. Right. right. Right, it's one of those plants, right, it comes over and it was like, like 1794, some bloke brought it over. It's got some Latin name with some bloke's name in it. But we know it as spring beauty or miner's lettuce. So this grows native in North America, came here, escaped from gardens. It's established in the wild. But it's actually very nice. But one of the things that I was really excited about on the list that you did bring... Yeah that's going to go with the ribs. So I've got these lovely Jacob's Ladders over here, which I've slowly cooked with mm. aromats. This has got some star anise, peppercorns, uh, little vegetables over here, some, some water, a little bit of parsley stalks, and you boil this and you just gently simmer this for about two or three hours and you produce these amazing chunks of meat. We're finishing them off on the barbecue. I'm going to finish off with a little bit of this glaze, but also some of this. I, this I am obsessed with. Not surprised. And it was actually Gareth Ward that introduced me to this. Was cause, it? Because they tap mm. their own trees and they produce this. But you're going to yep. tell us what it is, because this is this this is amazing. Yes. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Do you need that bowl? Because if not, I'll just tip all this water. I don't out. need the... Oh, well, go on, you're right, fine. <laughs> well, you won't taste... Right, so this is tree tapping, and at this time of year, it's fantastic. So there's certain trees you can tap, but this one is actually birch tree. So you can do birch tree and sycamore tree. So we've got birch tree sap here. All right, now what happens is at this time of year, and it's funny really, because we get back to mushrooms. So underneath the ground, the mushrooms will help a tree kickstart each year, a bit like when mushrooms, uh, when trees put all the energy down in the roots in autumn to kickstart the mushrooms breeding season. 
it works symbiotic. That's why you have mushrooms which are symbiotic, which are what morels are. They put all the nutrients back into the tree, the tree gets kick-started, and what it starts to do is it starts to draw up water. And what it'll do is it'll purify the water and it will take all the nutrients and it will impart sugars into it. And that's the amazing part. It's quite part. fascinating, isn't it, when nature, when you look at it like that, oh, that yeah. one works with the other one and not, not one contradicts the other one as well, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's, you know what? You, the relationships between plants, mushrooms, animals, everything's, you know, we might not always see the purpose, but there is always a purpose. Right. So this is this is this is the syrup straight out the tree. This is it? So nothing, straight out the tree. This is nothing this. processed or anything. Cheers. So so this is as it is, mm -hmm. like this, mm -hmm. and you tap it. I mean, I've seen Gareth at this place yeah, when you yeah. tap the tap in the tree. You, yeah. Just to yeah, well, explain the process. Right. Okay. So you have your tree. You put a little hole in it. And then you put um, like a, a tree tap, you can get a tree tapping kit, and then you get a little tube and fill up your container. I would recommend you only do it once to a tree. And you need a tree with a fairly light like, about that. Once a year or? Once, just once. Just once? Yeah, I, 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 if you want to keep your tree, because you're going to kill it if you keep on doing it because you're depriving it of nutrients and also putting a hole in it, they're not quite happy about that. So. <laughs> It's, says it how it is. <laughs> it's, 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 it's kind of like common sense. But you can taste there's, 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 um, there's something there, isn't it? But, I mean, imagine, you know, if you haven't got access to clean water, and it's a bit like what they do in India with the reed beds, you know, they filtrate the um, water through the reed beds to, pur to, to purify, purify it. It's exactly the same with what the birch tree does. So the does. tree does it naturally. Yeah, so there's a purification process going on. But then you take this is this is the science. This is what I love about this. Oh, you're going to get yeah. Is, the, then yeah. This, I'm going to serve this with these ribs because yeah. this is this makes it this makes this taste amazing. The steak's going to be there with the little morels over there, which are reducing down. Oh, I'm so glad I've got steak. Tell us about the, <laughs> tell us about this then, because this this is what you do with it. Because this is why I watch right, Gareth so, do this. Right. So this is a five litre container, and I brought it on. It's not pretty. It is ugly and it is clumpy, but there is a reason. Because oh. you need twenty of these. <laughs> to make that. Yeah. 20 of them? 20 of these, yeah. 25 litres. So it's 100 litres to one of them. See, the sound man's freaking out because we've got the dogs, we've got so many more in the lawn. It's countryside, all right? This is what <laughs> happens when you can say... When you, yeah, you can go foraging in the countryside, you get dogs and you get lawnmowers. Exactly. Isn't it? So this, so this, people think because you've got 20 of these, you put it in a big pan, you reduce it all down, you add colourings, you add sugar to the... Nothing yeah, is added no, to this at all. Absolutely nothing is added. Now, I've got a friend who's got an amazing piece of kit and it just, like, you pile it in one end and it goes through a process where it's boiling, reducing, reducing. It's got logs going underneath it. And it is just absolutely incredible the amount that you have to use just to get this. I mean, really, to be fair, that should be really expensive, but you can actually buy it. As long as it's pure, this is just absolutely amazing. So, what are people looking for when they're actually when you're looking at buying this? What what would it's just? It's got to be just pure birch, birch sap. tree sap, literally yeah. no other. So that ingredients. is just that's that, that is, reduced that down that. to. That's a hundred of these. Yeah. Sorry, they're not hundred. It's twenty of yeah. these. It's <laughs> getting more expensive. Twenty of these. Minute. Right, mix one of those. Mix one of those. There you go. Just have a taste of that because I think this. When you taste maple syrup, this this is on a different planet. Oh, right, is that the best thing I brought on the show? It's, well, considering you didn't bring the other three things <laughs> that you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> it's, 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 I'm a forgiven, it's, I'm a forgiven. Well, not, not necessarily forgiven, no, but, Go you know, on, we'll on. get you on again, Emma. to be honest with you, yeah. When All you can right. be bothered to get the other three things that you were supposed to bring down, but... Yeah, next month, maybe. But, look, yeah, but look, you got... That's classic forager for you there, right there. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah, well, you know you wanted Happen that. All the time you twice. wanted that, but I've actually brought this because it's better. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's better. And twice the price normally. Do you know what yeah. it was? It's because... <laughs> Yeah, you may say it's better because we're both from the similar side of the part of the country. Oh. It's basically good. Whether you can be bothered to go up there and get it, I reckon oh, that's down to. But there we have it. The fabulous Alicia Vasey, everybody. Yeah. Right, you have the steak. Is that all right? Oh, yeah. You're having the ribs? It's fun for me, that, yeah. <laughs> That's just, a, with, the, with the bursts up as well, you've got nice and forks over there. But this this is amazing stuff. It holds really well as well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's quite... Yeah. It's not bad, is it? Super tasty over the top. There yeah, you go. I thought I'd be a bit of greenery. 
steak and rolls. I, I, these, these are amazing as well. well. While we didn't get the three ingredients that we're supposed to have, these are, this is a <laughs> decent supplement. <laughs> but that is one of the nicest things you brought on the show. Because I know it is. It's brilliant stuff. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. You taste that with the, the, the birch sap as well. It's just... All right. So, I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Mm. Happy? Mm -hmm. She's happy. It's mm -hmm. good. It's the first time I can actually speak without her speaking in the way. <laughs> uh, right, Ronnie will be cooking for us later on this show. I'll be showing a show-stopping dish of squid and prawns for all my guests a little bit later. But I'll be back here in a few minutes with another unmissable masterclass. Now you can speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Now I'll be treating Joe Pasquale to a plate of squid and prawns shortly and Mr Ronnie Murray, the chef, will be taking over the kitchen duties. That's coming up next. But first, it's time for this week's Masterclass. And this week I thought I'd do something a little bit different and look at the essential bits of kit that every cook and chef needs in their kitchen. This is like a, the ultimate car boot sale, really, if there was one. This would be surrounded by chefs, really, buying this bit of kit. This kit that I've collected over the years, and some modern stuff, some old stuff, some traditional stuff, um, but it just shows you a little insight of where food's going, where it's gone, some of the classic sort of stuff that's still around, really, and what to look out for. So if you're looking for something for a keen cook or a keen chef, and you're looking for something as a gift, but looking further afield on the internet, this is what you need to look out for. Now, there's been a huge influence recently on social media, TikTok and that kind of stuff, uh, about chefs using these little moulds. And I'm going to start off over here. So these are the classic little moulds that we've got over here. You used to be able to do these, these little silicone moulds, which are brilliant for Yorkshire puddings and, and, and desserts. You can freeze these, you can cook them, pop them out, they're brilliant. But this is where soup sort of food tendency is going now, particularly on social media. These are the little sort of moulds that you get. Now, these are available online, really. Uh, there's places in Switzerland that do it. You can buy them in France. These are little silicone moulds, and you get amazing little patterns for it. And what it does, it, it enables you to make twill mixes or, or different types of twill mixes. This is a sweet one. You can do a savoury one. Sometimes you'll see them online with squid ink. Sometimes you'll see them with beautiful green with basil in there as well. So they're like a, a, like a, a herb biscuit. But it enables you to then make these little patterns on here. And these moulds are so good and so precise that the way they make them. And it holds the shape and holds the the colour and the texture of everything when you bake it. So this just gets popped in the oven. You'll see what I mean in a second. Even down to this, these little step palette knives, these are what I use all the time, these little tiny ones. And you probably see me, if you ever see me in the restaurant kitchen, then you'll see me all the time with this. This is my step palette knife in the back of the pocket. This is what chefs love. And so much so that I have to brand it at the back because... Chefs accidentally put it in their bit of kit at the end of service. But these are sort of step palette knives. These are essential bits of kit in, in any restaurant kitchen and any home kitchen as well. These are brilliant. So while they're in the oven, we're going to run through all this sort of stuff over here. It sounds daft. String. Butcher string. This is a gift for a chef. It's fantastic. It sounds ridiculous, but this holds the tension in meat. You can't do this with normal sort of... Uh, 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 particularly string that you buy for your garden or anything else like that. If you use conventional string, it can rip and, and tear. This will hold it all together. It's a butcher's twine. There's been a huge influence recently over sort of Japanese-style cooking uh, in sort of commercial restaurants as well. And it's starting to produce that into domestic kitchens here in the UK. So we've got a selection of few bits of Japanese equipment over here. These tins are fantastic. It sounds daft, but these little stainless steel tins, this is where chefs would put all their little mise en place, their preparation for service, all in here, and you'd have these in the tins, nice and neat, so you know exactly what you're doing. And really what you'd have is this and that lined up on there, and you can grab bits and pieces. But this is if you're doing a dinner party and bits and pieces and that kind of stuff, you'd have everything just all in its particular place. They're the little Japanese tins. <coughs> a few other things you can get online from Japanese suppliers are over here. These little small knives, these are just lovely. Look at this little, little ginger knife. It's an absolutely beautiful little thing. As well as a little wasabi grater. This is great for grating wasabi, but also ginger. Uh, you can do garlic on there. It's really sort of sharp. Sometimes you get these out of shark skin as well, but this one's metal, but you get these blades are tiny, but really sharp. When you rub the garlic on it or rub the wasabi, you get it into a nice paste. That's another good thing to look out for. 
Talking again about Japanese style food, you'll see me cook a lot on the show and a lot when I'm traveling around all over the place, is I cook on these. These are sort of these Japanese grills. You can get these online. Um, the great thing about these, they retain the heat. But the key to this, if you are gonna do it, start off with a bit of normal domestic charcoal, even the, the light bag one, you can just pop that in there. But the key to that is the charcoal that we've got in here the compressed Japanese charcoal. It gets super hot, and that's the most important bit. A few pieces of that. You only want probably three of those in amongst the rest of the charcoal that you're going to use. The rest of the charcoal will sort of die down after about 20 minutes. This will stay hot for about two hours, three hours. It gets super, super hot, and it's brilliant for stuff like this. Moving over here, <coughs> these are things like a nice little gift. These are, these are a Japanese sort of uh, teriyaki brushes. They're, they're like horsehair, really, really fine. You wouldn't use these for sort of uh, uh, egg wash and that kind of stuff, but just delicate little bit of cooking to finish off the little bit of fish on the barbecue. These are fantastic. These are old school. I say, I can't get rid of these because I actually love them. Parisienne scoops or melon ballers. They used to be really famous in the 80s and 90s in, for chefs, but the little small little print scoops, these are brilliant for little vegetables and little garnishes like that. When you talk about Carving forks, I always say the best carving fork I always find is, is not a curved one, it's a flat one, because you, it's multi-purpose. You can use this for pasta. Take a pasta and, and roll your fork like that and it'll fork it all up into a, little, into a little ladle and you get a nice little portion of pasta. So that's another one to look out for. <coughs> little thermometers, these are essential nowadays. This is the modern version nowadays. You used to be able to press it with your finger or put a, put a skewer in it and put it on your lip to see whether the meat's cooked. Now you can push this straight into the piece of meat and tell whether the meat or the fish is cooked in the center. Little digital thermometers, really, really good to have. Talking about preparation, we've got these. These are little sort of, these are these to remove the, the bones out of fish. This is a good one as well. This actually removes scales from fish. So this, you take the head, uh, of the fish, put it into the sink, grab the tail, and you scrape that on the top, and it removes, removes the scales in about 30 seconds. It's a brilliant and inexpensive bit of kit. I think this was about a quid, something like that. It's not a lot of money. If you're looking after safety, looking after your knives as well, I always know, put the knives in a roll, and I've got knife kits like this. If, if you... If you don't put, want to put them in the, things like this, try not to put the knives in a drawer and you're doing that backwards and forwards. Always put them in a knife block. Alternatively, if you didn't want to do that, go online, you can get these. These are really cheap. These are little sort of knife cases, and you put the knife over there. Once it's sharp, it means that when you put them in the drawer, it doesn't blunt when you rub them together. So look out for these. These are really, really good thing to have as well. It sounds daft as peelers as well. I'm doing an event next month, and I'm peeling 400 apples a day. Me, peeling 400 apples a day. It sounds daft. You go for the peeler that looks the coolest. The best peeler is this one. They're, they're the cheapest. It's the sharpest. It's brilliant. And when you're peeling loads of apples, it just works. So I think over time, this is how they designed the peeler originally, and then they've got really modern and funky. It's the old school ones are the best ones, which is this one. It's a nice little speed peeler. Running through just a few other bits of kit as well that we've got over here. This is called Maurice's. So these are spatulas. It sounds daft because you go into the shop and you buy this one, it looks really cool. These are the best. It's French. Uh, these are the ones that do the little non-stick mats as well. These ones, it's the same company, but this, you get different shapes. So if you're creating a nice little, you've got to, you pick all of it, and it just feels right in your hand. You've got the flat-bladed one and the, the round-bladed one, like that, the, the little curve. This is brilliant if you want to scoop out the mashed potato into that sort of fantastic little quenelle shape. This is the one you look for, but it's brilliant for mixing things. It bends better, it falls around the bowl better, and it's, it's really a chef's thing. These are fantastic. Finally, before we wait on our nice little bit of... Oh, it's nearly there. Look, I'll show you. I'll show you this. Just before we got into our bit more serious bits of kit. But just to show you these, as you lift this, these, you can't do this with a bigger palette knife. These are why these are a little essential bits of kit. But if you lift off these little bits like that, just allow it to cool, this then lifts off, and you can shape this into a nice little leaf. Now, this mixture, this twill mix, is when it's hot, it bends because it's got egg white in it, and when it's cold, it sets. And you can just leave that and put that on top of a dessert, onto cake. It just makes it look fantastic as well. You see a lot of chefs doing that, a lot of doing sweet and savoury dishes, really sort of fine, intricate ones and intricate moulds as well. It makes, makes the food look amazing. Just a few other bits and pit, kit before we get into the big one. Blowtorch, you see a lot of chefs use blowtorches. The best way to do it is I always get a blowtorch that's self-igniting. So one that you can just ignite yourself rather than trying to find a match everywhere. This is, 
it's a little bit more money. We're talking about a couple of quid, but it saves you all the hassle in the world. So get yourself a proper, proper blowtorch. Not the little one that you've got to self-fill. This is the one you need to look out for. Whisks. A good quality whisk. People always buy whisk because it looks cool. It, it's, it needs to be practical. So you have this, this thing called a balloon whisk. And a balloon whisk is this big end to the whisk. Sometimes they're even bigger as well, the French style balloon whisk. You need the big end to this because as you're whisking it up like that, you get so much more volume into a souffle and egg whites. Finally, before we go, chefs love these. If you want a quick soup, this will blend and heat at the same time. You put the carrots in, put the, the milk in, press the temperature, walk away, five minutes, you've got carrot soup. Done. Easy as that. If you want it fine, fine like that, that doesn't heat up, then you go in for a mixture like this, and then you've got the super duper sort of Paco Jets. But either way, the best bit of kit in this entire kitchen is what all of this are on. This classic French style cooker. We've got deep fryers over here, inbuilt water, teppanyaki grills, electric cooking, because electric cooking is best because it only heats up when you put the pan on it. Because chefs in a commercial kitchen, if it's gas, they walk in, turn up all the gas, all the heat and all that energy, all the money is going through the ventilation up into the atmosphere. So electric wherever possible, but the best commercial or the best domestic induction hobs is what you need to look for. You need less of them. And for this show, I only use two. You've seen this. But this is the little creme de la creme when I bought this stove, is that I've got something to keep my spoons nice and clean. Because this water is set at 75 degrees and it drains off all the dirt from the spoons, drains it out, and I've got clean spoons throughout a cooking show. There we have it. Now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about, a little mask us, then do get in touch with us if you can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes when Chef Ronnie Murray will be here with a recipe for fish pie. Clean this lot away, otherwise that will be in his pocket. Welcome back. Now, I'll be making a sensational salt and pepper squid and prawns for my guest, Joe Pasquale, very surely. But first, I'm here with Jude and Alicia, and we're getting ready to taste a dish from a chef whose CV includes spells in the kitchens of some of London's most iconic restaurants. It's the brilliant Ronnie Murray. <laughs> Great to have you back on the show, chef. Now, is, is you need a dessert with you or something quite uh, off the charts and that well, omelette thing you did was amazing? This is something... More traditional. I, th I thought I'd just go for a nice dish midweek. Yeah. Family feeder. Okay. So this is the fish pie. So we're going to do a fish pie. So yeah. my my take on a fish pie is something a little bit easier that you okay. can do midweek. Fish from a supermarket, ideally nice fish from a good fishmonger. But, yeah. You know all your all your trim left over. Yeah. That you've got in the freezer is another good way to use up this. So we got some cod, we got some salmon, and we got some smoked haddock that you. Yeah, really sort of classic it. fish pie ingredients. Yep. You could use anything, like I say, a bit of trim that you've got left over. If you don't like salmon, if yep. you're not keen, you could uh, you could do a bit of trout or, or sub it with anything, really. Now, this this the, the restaurants that I was saying, well, I didn't get to say on the list, really, the places where you worked. I mean, these are some of the most, most iconic restaurants in the country. Well, yeah, I've done, I've done, a, I've done a few very, very nice restaurants, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what have you got? You're working with the sauce, first of all. This so is, we're just going to do a really... A little bit for you. Yeah, you. we're just going to do a really... Just a really basic kind of bechamel white sauce, if you like. So a bit of butter, sugar... Uh, butter, sugar. Okay. Yeah. A bit of butter and flour. So just a just a really basic sauce. I mean, you know, in, a, in the restaurant, we'd do a nice fish stock or maybe a biscuit in there, yeah. or the shellfish prawns. But this is just literally something that you can really quickly whip up at home midweek. Where did your love affair of food start, start then? I, don't, I think I always had a love affair with food. So the food was always around when we were at home. You know, my mum, my grandma are both really good cooks. So we just, so there's always sort of, you know, home cooking and food around. So I guess I just all, always had food about. But getting into work with those amazing, because, I mean, the restaurants, the Jay Sheikis and all the ones that I, I, you know, we could list tons of them. Yeah. The Ivy and all these places. I mean, they're iconic places. Yeah. I'm a blagger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe what it. Was, what was that like working in there, though? Because they, they are, the pressure's really on you, isn't it, really? Because you've got the iconic recipes that, when I say about iconic restaurants, these are restaurants that yeah, you yeah. go to because you go to for a particular dish. They go there, they went there for the apple pie, they went there for the fish pie, you know? Yeah. They, what was that like, really? Really, Because there's no really restaurants like that, I suppose, is there, no, really? I guess... I you mean, can fluctuate. At, yeah, and at the time, you know, the likes of Chic Kids and stuff was very much, you know, uh, some, you know so they're some of London's oldest restaurants that we, that we always almost kind of put back to their former glory, if you like. You know, yeah. we, we, you know when we opened 
uh, when you open Scotch and a ma obviously massive team and Tim and the you know Tim and the guys find these restaurants and sort of put them back to their for, you know former glory. And I came in just after Jeremy Corbyn and uh, uh, Jeremy King and Chris Corbyn rather, and you know that's that was their kind of thing. So I was sort of on the tail end of that. That, that sort of sweet spot and, you know, the chefs and stuff that we had in the kitchen there have gone on to do some amazing things, right? So what have you just, what have you just done that we've got over here? So what we've cooked we... out the flour and the butter and then we've just put the milk and the cream in there and then I was just about to chop the gherkin and the uh, capers, but you know, that you're very good at this stuff. Well, well, just... got, in, <laughs> got, got in there before me. And then now you're doing a little bit of consultancy work for, for the new generation, younger generation, as, as well as the classics as well. Yeah, so I was, I've, I've done, a, um, yeah, I've done, all sorts of bits and pieces and sort of sort of fallen into event work a bit if you like but that's been uh, that's been really good and quite interesting so we just done um, we just done Twickenham with uh, Ollie Debu which being a massive rugby fan was perfect so we did the England Wales game and I went and did three or four days cooking and then we watched the game yeah <laughs> so kind of my, my two my two loves together so that was perfect that's fantastic isn't it yeah, yeah so that's uh, that's been really nice so I've diced up I've diced up the fish that you've got in there yeah uh, yeah, I'll... so that's good. So we might maybe take a bit out of that. That looks a bit, uh, bit generous. Well, I was just... I, I didn't <laughs> know what the recipes portion. were, yeah. Chef, so... <laughs> well, I think you've got all the fish there. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you can put it... Yeah, no, no, it's, 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 it's fine, it's fine. No, it's fine, it's fine, cos you, you just do all the prep. This it's is... next door neighbour's cat. It's fine, yeah. it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> you got to turn round and it's done. Well, <laughs> where, where were you when I was up against it? <laughs> exactly. Oh, this would have been perfect. Yes. <laughs> there we go. So you're just basically there going to go. take that our mashed potato and you want to basically infuse that with a little bit of milk and some white pepper. Yeah, so, so, so just basic mash. We didn't obviously bother to do that because it's not very interesting on the TV, is it? It's peeling potatoes. Yeah. Uh, and then we're just going to put a bit of parsley through the sauce. So, yeah, fish, you know, nice nice to get your fish from a fishmonger. But this is, you know, to be honest, you could use frozen or whatever you've got in the freezer, something like, you know, all the, all the use up the bits and pieces. That's generally why fish pies on the menu mm. in fish restaurants, right? To use yeah. up all the bits and pieces. But when you're doing stuff like that, I think the smoked haddock, the natural smoked haddock is the critical oh, one. Oh, you've got to go yeah. undyed. I never buy dyed smoked haddock. Yeah. I can't think of anything more vile. Yeah, that's what that you bright want. yellow stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It just yeah. doesn't look right, does Something's it? Something's not quite right about that, right? Right. So there we have our spuds. Yeah, it's a nice bit that? of nice bit of dry mash there. Yeah, and, and then, then you want to add. Yes, yeah, so you're going to whack in a bit of bit of butter. Bit of your favourite ingredient. Chef. Well, I just bit thought of, a bit, bit of, of butter. A little bit of butter. And then um, white pepper used for this. Yeah, always white. But the only time I ever use white pepper is in a white sauce or mashed potato. That's it. Right. So where's the thing I have to dig out the back of the cupboard in, all right? Yeah. Right, so in there, a little bit of, little bit of Dijon mustard. A little bit of mustard. Any, any old mustard, we happen to have Dijon, but yeah. Right. Whole grain's quite nice in there. So we're mixing that together. And like then, this. oddly enough, a bit of cheese. Yeah. So that helps thicken the sauce. Like I say, this is not, you know, this is not exactly what we would do in a restaurant. This is just, a, just an easy one for home. So sort of try and pick the ingredients that, that you're likely to have lying around. And a really good tip for you here is, so the fish is cold, obviously raw, other than the prawns that are cooked. So I'm going to pipe mash on top. Now, everyone knows when you try and put mash on top of something that's hot, it gets very messy, right? So there's two tips for you here. One is to pipe the mash on top. So if you spoon it on and then you fork it, you're naturally putting pressure on it, so it's going to spill out everywhere. So everyone's nervous with a piping mash. It doesn't really matter, just as long as you get it on top, and that takes the pressure off. But the other one is peas. Peas in a fish pie, so frozen. So if you use frozen, fro if you use frozen peas, that acts as a natural, almost like a blast chiller, right? So yeah. it's going to it's going to yeah. chill everything down really quickly. So our sauce becomes nice and nice and thick and takes the heat out of it. Oh, that's a good so I'm tip. thinking, yeah. do you know what I mean? I'm thinking, thinking kids. You know, you come in from work, whatever you're doing, on a Wednesday night, everything's a bit chaotic. So, you know, fish pie people would go, oh, that sounds a bit technical. This is the idea of this, is, it's nice and quick. Nice. I love the pita. That's a really good idea. It's just really good. Like, you have to, like, you know, sort of try and think like a chef, but how you do that at home. I, I don't imagine most people have got a blast chiller. Right? You've probably got one under here somewhere. I haven't got one. I haven't got one. Don't look at me. No. Right, and then we got our. So you could do this with puff pastry. 
Controversially, yeah, you could, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you could do, yeah, I don't think that's not that controversial, but you, yeah, you could do pastry, you could, I mean, to be honest, you could just, you could just do nice bre a herby breadcrumb over that, yeah, be nice, it's, it? it's interesting with this, that, that you look at the texture of the sauce, I always think with, with fish pie you want to make the sauce slightly thicker than you think. Yeah, that's exactly, especially if, you're do, if, especially if you're not cooking the fish before you put it in the sauce, so you'll get that natural water out of the, out of the fish, and you're right, good, good shout. And then everything goes a bit sloppy, so you want it... If you bit. make the sauce too watery, first of all, the whole thing's really watery yeah. at the end, yeah. Yeah, and then you're in a world of pain. But you want it nice and full and you want it to bubble over. I always think that's part of the, part of the appeal. And do you want me to pipe or you're, you're right? I, don't, I can pipe if you want. Right, it's I, not so I, you I, cheap, I, I, aren't I, I, Whenever I'm on it, you always say you do all the work, so I thought I'd better... <laughs> I, better I better look like I'm, I've done something today. Oh, you've done that before? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, once once you made a few of these in, in your time. Once or twice. So we used to have this on the weekend menu at Sheikis, and I was on the pastry at the time, and it was our job to cook it. Now, you know, pastry chefs don't listen to service. So the amount of times you got <laughs> shouted at for not having it in the oven. <laughs> Yeah, you're oh. in your whole little world around the back as a pastry chef. Yeah, either. exactly, you know. And then suddenly you have to get involved in service, which probably helped me out, to be honest, because it made me pay attention to what was going on in the kitchen. <laughs> Just to stay out Do of you trouble. miss that now or not? It's supposed to be a great thing about doing what you do. You can dab into that whatever you so want. So I dip in and out, so I have the best of both worlds. I can still be, as my wife calls me, sometimes I can be a normal human being. <laughs> be, be in a domestic environment, right. <laughs> and, but I can still You're manageable. Yeah. So now, so now we don't live in London. So I tend to go into London. I do a few days at a time. I, I take myself out of so I can be chefy yeah. away from the, <laughs> away from home life, and then I can go back and be normal. Go back off. into it. But yeah, exactly. So once you've made that, I'm assuming you can stick that in the fridge. Yeah, so, so you, could, you could fridge it or you could put it straight in. Another good one to do is, this is quite a big recipe, so we use those um, little tin foil containers you can get. So we just make one for us and then I do two for when I'm away and then the wife just takes them out and puts them in the oven and it's, I suspect she probably eats them yeah, out of the container that, and it goes yeah. in the bin and then yeah. there's no washing up either. <laughs> but then this is but what it looks like. The tip is you yeah, want to yeah, put yeah. it on a... I'm moving it. You want to put, you wanna put it on it. a baking tray, Look so you that. see what's up in there. That, for me, is a good sign. Look at that. Nice colour, all bubbled out. Mm. Yeah, that looks all good. Perfect. Yeah. And then we'll just take a nice big... Yeah, no. We'll sorry, take yeah. a spoon out of that. I've got mash everywhere. <laughs> Beyond my ears. But you dive into that. Look at that. Wow. Look at that. Do you know, it's not watery either, is it? No, it's perfect. It's, it's, you just make that sauce a little bit thicker than you think. Yeah. yeah just it's nice adding the cheese to the sauce as well. Well, that sort of just, it just helps. If you haven't quite cooked that flour and, you know, it's very forgiving, this recipe. So if you haven't quite cooked that flour out, that's good. Not, not a great visual one. But... That's a decent portion there, Chief. <laughs> so give us the name of this dish. about midweek fish pie. That's, that's what it says the great man himself, done. <laughs> Right, there you have it. Ooh. One appetite. Thank you very much. Ooh. Looks like me and they have got yeah. the pot. To well, be honest. Just <laughs> Standard chef's fare. We're going to have to share. <laughs> yeah, I did too. <laughs> I was getting a bit nervous. And, mm. It's beautiful, so isn't good. it? Actually, I'm interested in trying the sauce with um, Cornish ones and capers. It's really nice with the capers, capers in it. And, mm. Mm, it's delicious, isn't it? That? Capers and the Cornish ones are gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely perfect. Legendary, delicious. that as well. There we have it. Ronnie Murray, everybody. <laughs> Good was that? Delicious, that. Really good. Right, we've still got time for one more final course. So join us again after the break. We'll be risking up salt and pepper squid and prawns for all my guests, including Joe Pasquale. I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> Welcome back, sadly, to the last part of the show. Yeah. But uh, Judy's sadly and is only on his way back to Cornwall for service, but I'm here with Ronnie, Alicia, and, of course, the very funny Joe Pasquale. Thank you. Uh, because we're going to do, like, uh, another one of your favourite dishes, we're going to do salt and pepper, squid and shrimp. Yeah, I love a bit of fish. It's, that's all right. So yeah. we've got some prawns, I've got some squid over here. I'm going to simply prepare it. I'm going to do this with a, a nice little bit of jam as well. Now, uh, that's going to basically... We're going to slice this up into rings, and then I'm going to mix that together with a little bit of egg white. And then in there, we've got breadcrumbs, we've got some black pepper as well, and add the salt. The shrimp, you can just de-vein, just nice and simple. Just take the veins out, like that one. And then they're going to go in. So, first of all, we talked about earlier on in your career. I want to go 
to the present day as well, because we mentioned the tour, but we didn't give the name of the tour that you're oh, on yeah. as well. Yeah, it's called uh, 40 Years of CAC, The New Normal. Yeah. Because <laughs> it is, I've been doing CAC for 40 years. And normality, I don't even know what, what... You know, everybody keeps using that phrase, what's oh, the new normal. And I don't even know what... Nor you know, normality, I always say the quote is, normality is a state of mind exclusive to the innate perception of the individual. Because what is normal to you, and what is normal to you, Ronnie, and what is normal to you, Lisa, isn't necessarily normal to me. My normality isn't, certainly isn't normal to, to you lot, because... My normal man, and I'm, you know, I look, I'm a bloke on his own, so my normality is quite bizarre, really. <laughs> you, you, I mean, the tour, you must absolutely love this, the, the tour as a, as a comedian as well. Yeah. But one thing that I'm fascinated about, really, the, the, the bigger you are in comedy, and you've been doing this, like I said, for 40 years now, yeah. do you still have to go down the route where you're doing the smaller gigs before you head out on tour to no, test, I do, test I, these? How do you test...? No, I, I, <laughs> once again, I don't test anything. <laughs> Look, I don't I, test nothing at all. That's another yeah, yeah. I mean, that'd I, be annoying. I yeah. literally fly by the seat in my pants, OK, put that in. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, I don't do it again. Simple as that, <laughs> really. Um, and the audience know that. And I'm, I treat it as... A, uh, I'm like a, a kid up there, you know. I'm like a 13-year-old uh, with a load of bag of toys and I just play for an hour. And I think... Um, I think it was Jim, Jim Carrey quote. He said that um, when people watch comedy, what they want is to be free of concern for the amount of time that they're watching this performance. And because everybody's got so many concerns in their life, if you can give people that freedom for that hour or so... Yeah, yeah. as a release from that period of time that they don't have to worry about the things that are going on in, in the world, in their life. And by doing that, I get that freedom of concern as well, though. Because the only thing you can do when you're doing that, the only thing you can think about is that performance. It's like flying the plane. When you're flying a plane, the only thing you think about is flying that plane. If you think about what you're going to have for tea, you might as well forget it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like fixing the plane, because you do realise you do realise you've got a, a proper flight engineer. Is that what we call it, flight engineer? So, aircraft engineer, yeah. right, I was on... Quite a few squadrons, but I suppose the main one was 814 Squadron anti-submarine, anti-submarine torpedo warfare. Yeah, basically, and um, and I was airframes engines, all right, which is a grubber. So you had your your, your pinkies were your radars and your, your radio, and then your greenies were your electronics. Couldn't work that out. What do you think we call Concordia? Yeah. <laughs> so so, no so I just I just I just went with stuff that you could see. Just get your ends dirty. You right. like, like, people Probably fascinate dirty. lives, aren't they? That's what I, yeah. I find everybody that comes to me, everybody's got a fascination with lives. And you read this, I don't even read these scripts anymore, but like, <laughs> you, read them, you read them on a night and you sort of take it all in. Because some of the stuff that you've been doing, you know, theatres and comedy, and people know you from comedy, but the Muppets, I've got to talk about this because. Oh, the Muppets. The Muppet show was fantastic. What happened? Thought, but out of all the highlights that you've done, you think of the Muppets at, the, yeah. at that particular time. That was, like, massive. It was massive. What happened was I, I did a Royal Variety show and they had a Muppet segment on it. Yeah. And the producer of that... So they got the, an independent producer for that part of the show. And then I, I got very friendly with the producer. He was a great bloke, uh, Martin G. Baker, who's a, a fantastic producer and director. And then um, he said... He phoned me up out the... I did his son's bar mitzvah. And then he phoned me up... Right. Yeah. See what I mean? no. You couldn't write this, you see? And then he, he phoned me up about six months later. He said, are you, are you working next weekend? I said, yeah, I'm rehearsing Panto. So he said, well, do you think you can get away for the weekend and come and do the uh, show in, in Los Angeles? So I said, what show? He went, it's the 25th anniversary of the Muppets. And I've shown them your tapes and they think you're a human Muppet. And, <laughs> and they, they want you to come out and do a bit. So I said, you want him out? He said, no. So you and don't then, have to make up comedy, you just do live stories. <laughs> It's that, true. It's, it's true. You're sat here going, what on earth am I just walking into? It's true. So, look, I don't know how I'll get onto that with my with my jam, but, look, I've taken all the ingredients. In there, we've got some chilli, I've got some lemongrass, and then we're going to add some tomatoes. You basically put everything into here, so you blend it all in, like that, and then all we do with this is you take our entire mixture, which is this, pop it into a pan, and load it full of brown sugar, like that, wow. and vinegar. That's a lot of sugar. Yeah, red wine vinegar. You put red wine vinegar on it, and then you gently, gently cook it. And it wants to cook for a good sort of uh, 15, 20 minutes. Just gently, gently simmer it like that, a good half an hour, maybe something like that, if you've got the amount that I've got in this pan. And you end up with this. This is this chilli jam, which is this, this red pepper-based chilli jam as well. Then we've got lime. We've got lime juice we're going to put over there as well, which is going to go into our little bit of cream. Ronnie's there doing our... Little batches of, of shrimp and everything else, which I'm going to take a little bit of this as well over the top. But that must have been one of the highlights of your 
Do you look back and think... <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd look back and go, who was that bloke that, that, that had a little kid from Grey's that didn't get any CSEs um, <laughs> ended up doing all this sort of stuff? Well, I want about new faces as well, because we touched on it earlier. This, this, was, this was a time, and you remember watching it. I, I, yeah, I this watched was a it. Time, but I was just mentioned, when the family used to sit round, yeah, yeah. and that was the thing. Yeah, yeah. You used to sit round and watch it. Yeah, it's weird, but isn't that it? Was a, that, you never trained to do that. You never... No, I never trained to do anything at all. I thought, what am I going to... I never knew what I was... Even now, I'm 63 this year, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? What job... You know, I always think, what's next? You know, I, I'm, I'm very aware of my own mortality, and I think there's, got, there's a new adventure yeah. around the corner all the time. You're spending most of the time on the road as well. Cause yeah, this, I am, yeah. This tour, this tour takes you length and breadth of the UK. Yeah. Uh, and I... like, like I was saying, it's... it's Touring is, is, is for a comedian. That is that is the that is, is the, the best part of it. It's what but we're comedy has changed. Not I'm talking about the content of comedy has changed. Yeah. But also the volume of audience has changed massively. Oh, completely. And and, and we were saying earlier about the, the style of comedy is changing all the time. So you have to keep up with. It. The thing is, I've never been fashionable, right? I've never been a fashion comedian, <laughs> right? I'm not. You but, have. No, I'm not. You but, have. But it also by not being fashion means I've never been out of fashion. Right. I've always been that bloke that's just there. And I quite like that position. Just yeah, I'm just there. I'm still doing it, and I still love doing it. That's the bottom line. Is I still love trying to make people laugh. Yeah. And it is just sometimes you have to say try because you don't. You know, it's not always as easy. I remember the worst. I think the worst heckle I ever had. I was in Wow. I was in a place called Bargoid in Gwent at a club. It was a long time ago now. And there was a bloke uh, at the bar with his mate, and there wasn't many people in the club anyway. And he was on crutches. And I, won't, I can't tell you exactly what he said, but roughly, <laughs> he, he shout, shouted something in Welsh and he threw, actually threw the crutches at me and fell over, <laughs> right? And, and I got off, I'm not hanging about here, so I got off and took the crutches with me and his mate came and said round the back, he went, can I have my mate's crutches? So I said, yeah, only if you tell me what he said. And he said, I'd rather fall over than listen to this rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say rubbish, right? And he actually threw the crutches and fell over. And I thought, that's the best heckle I've ever had in my life. No one yeah, yeah, I didn't realise the comedy circuit was so dangerous for that as well, but yeah. didn't you get impaled by antlers on oh, the last yeah. tour? Oh, yeah, last year, last year, yeah. Is that I, the last tour? How yeah. on earth do you get paled by yeah. antlers on a comedy tour? Oh, uh, well... <laughs> well, that's a long story. So, basically, I, I do all this stuff, all these puns with, uh, about, about being expensive and being very dear and all this sort of stuff with a big pair of moose antlers. And invariably, as you know, on stage, if you do a live show, at the end of the show, the lights go up in the audi audience and they go off on stage for some... They bring the curtain in and for some reason, other the lights go out on stage. Anyway, the moose antlers were there. I trip over them in the dark. <gasps> And, and I see them come. I just watched the new Mission Impossible film, and I thought, I'm going to die here. I'm actually going to die. I could see these prongs coming at me. And I spun in midair. I just channeled Tom Cruise. I spun in midair. I landed smack in the middle of these antlers, right? But so uh, my whole body missed it. But the back of my leg got impaled by this antler, and I thought, well, it's a bit sore. I saw my tour, I saw Lee, my mate, on the, on the road. I said, well, Lee, I've looked, my, really have a look at my leg. I pulled my trousers down and he went, oh, he nearly fainted. And he went, you need the medic. So the medic came, he nearly fainted. He said, you are going to A&E. I said, it's Skegness, 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. I'm not going to A&E. <laughs> anyway, the next morning I was in, uh, I was in Bridlington. I went to the hospital about 7 in the morning and I met a, 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 a medic there. Um, and I'd met him about 30 years ago in the Falklands doing the troop stuff. And he just sewed me up, gave me an antibiotics and, and, and uh, uh, the injection. And he went, yeah, off you go, you're not going to die from that, it's just a moose. <laughs> <laughs> and there we have it. I've been told to recap the recipe, just get it on the internet. <laughs> I'm more interested about chatting to you about stories. But there Sorry. we have it, my salt and pepper squid with shrimp. You've got to go see him on tour, the absolute legend, Joe Pasquale, everybody. Easy as that. <laughs>
And yeah, really nice that. Just with a little bit, needs the cream in there as well, just to break it all yeah. down. Yeah, really nice. That's it. And like I said, that's all we've got time for today. A massive thank you to all my guests. That amazing dairy farmer earlier, Oliver Neagle, uh, Jude Kariyama, Ronnie, of course, Alicia, and the brilliant Joe Pasquale. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you back at the same time next Saturday morning, which is my house, where we've got recipes from Kenny Atkinson, Glyn Pinnell, Asma Khan, and loose swimming star Linda Robson will be joining us in the kitchen. Until then, have a great weekend. See you at my place next week. Bye for now.